Uh, today we are focusing in on this new covenant. We're thinking about how Jesus is the mediator, the facilitator, the broker of a new covenant, a new relationship between God and humans that is built on better promises. And if you're taking notes, um, I provokingly call my preach today, New, Bigger, and Better. Um, I said, this is the fourth in five talks on Hebrews. We've been going through September. And I said in the first talk in September that the word confidence is a key word in the book of Hebrews. Confidence. It was written to a group of Jewish believers in Jesus. They hadn't converted to Christianity. They'd received Jesus, Yeshua, as their Messiah. And they were being persecuted because of it. Things were tough because of it. And the writer to the Hebrews saying, be confident that this new way of being in relationship with God through Jesus, be confident that this way is the best. It's not easy following Jesus, but it is the best possible way to live. And so as we read this letter, we see again and again the writer saying, be confident, don't fall away, don't, uh, don't turn back to that old way of life. Following Jesus is the best possible way to live. And um, actually that word better um, or best or superior is a Greek word kreton, and it appears 13 times through the book of Hebrews. The whole book is structured around it. Chapters 1 and 2. Jesus is better than the angelic beings. He's better than the Torah, the Old Testament books. His is a better message. Chapter 3 and 4. Jesus is better than Moses. He leads us into a better promised land. He gives us a better rest. Chapters 5 and 6. Jesus is a better high priest is better even than Melchizedek. And Jenny Mariner preached on that brilliantly last week. I'd encourage you to listen to it. And chapters um, 8 through to 10, Jesus is a better sacrifice for sin. And as we've seen in today's reading, our focus, Jesus brings about a better covenant, a better relationship between God and humans. You see, you can come up with hundreds and thousands of ways to get to God. Religion does that. It comes up with its rules and regulations. You can come up with all your ideas and theories about how you can make yourself acceptable to God and be in relationship with God. But you need to know this. Jesus is always better. His way is the best. And actually, I've been reading through Hebrews and really focusing in. When you read it through, Hebrews can, dare I say, read a little bit like boys on the schoolyard arguing about whose is best. You know that boy in the schoolyard, it was always bigger and better. If you'd got new trainers that were 50 quid, his were 100 quid each. You know that boy that if you'd got a new coat that was 100 quid, his was a grand. If you'd been... On holiday to Tenerife, he'd been up to eleven a reef. It's always one bigger, always one better, you know. And and, and we don't. It's not very English, that is it. We we as English, it's not very English culture that you would boast about knowing something or having something that's bigger and better. We we like to be humble. We like to be modest. We leave we leave bigger and better to our American friends over the pond. But seriously, read through Hebrews and you will see that the writer is systematically and methodically going through everything before and showing how Jesus is bigger and better. You see, that old way with Moses, it was amazing. I mean, Moses led God's people out of Egypt and out of slavery. How amazing is that? Jesus is better. He leads us out of sin and out of death. That old way, well, it was amazing. It had high priests who could intercede for us. But Jesus is better because he's a permanent priest. He's a perfect priest. 
Well, that old way was wonderful. It was amazing because every year you could have a sacrifice made for your sin. How amazing is that? But Jesus is better. He becomes a once and for all perfect sacrifice that cleanses us forever. This way of being in relationship with God through Jesus is the best possible way to live. And I just want to emphasize that again today, church, because I think it's got some massive implications. You know, to say that this way of being in relationship with God through Jesus is bigger and better, that's not, it's not arrogant, it's not superior, it's, it's confidence, it's conviction. It has some massive implications. You know, this, this really affects our witness. It affects our evangelism. It affects us sharing our faith with others because unless you really, truly know and truly believe in your heart that Jesus is the best, then you're never going to have the, the drive or motivation or conviction to invite someone else to come and follow him with you, are you? Unless you truly know that following Jesus is the best, you're never going to say to a friend or a colleague or a neighbor, you know, only Jesus is the solution for this challenge you're facing in life. This really affects our witness. And this affects our pursuit of purity. It affects our pursuit of holiness. Because unless you truly, really know and truly believe that Jesus' way is the best possible way to live, unless you really believe that, you'll always feel this drag back, this pull back into the old way into old sinful habits, into behaviors that don't truly satisfy. C.S. Lewis, I love how he talks about this. He says, we don't sin because we seek pleasure. He says, we sin because we don't seek enough pleasure. Because we don't know that the true and greatest and purest pleasure is found in relationship with Jesus. He says, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like kids in a slum splashing around in muddy puddles thinking they're having fun because they haven't realized just around the corner is a beautiful beach and an ocean for them to enjoy. We've got to know that this way of being in relationship with God through Jesus is the best. And that's what Hebrews is about, to really know and believe that Jesus is the best. Don't go back to that old way of life. One important aspect of that is the new covenant. So when we get to Hebrews 8, we start to read things like the new covenant is better than the old covenant. But what does that mean? What do we really mean by that? So um, what do we think of when we think of covenant? We think of a relationship. A covenant is like a legally binding relationship between two or more people or groups of people. A covenant sets out the terms and conditions and expectations of that relationship, of being in relationship together. These days, when we think of covenant, we might think of marriage. Marriage is a covenant. Two people make legally binding vows to each other to love and cherish in sickness and in health. All that I have is yours. It's a covenant. And just by the way, if you are married, please know that I and my team, we are praying for your marriage. We're praying for you for that covenant relationship. Don't let the enemy get a foothold into your marriage. Make that commitment to one another to, to love and to serve and to, and to bless each other, to bring forgiveness. Covenant, um, is, it's a relationship and marriage is a covenant relationship. If you've ever bought or sold a house, those two parties enter into a covenant. They've got to work out the terms and agreement. Uh, A soldier enters into a form of a covenant when they take an oath. A very simple level, if you've ever been employed, you should have had a contract. There's the employer and the employee. And the employee says, okay, I will meet my side. I will turn up at the time expected. I will work the hours expected. I will do the duties expected. That's my side of the agreement. The employer says, and I will pay you, and I'll pay you this amount at this time and ensure, I don't know, you've got all that you need and the safety that you need in your workplace. It's a legally binding agreement. It's a covenant. And this is the language that God uses to describe his relationship with humans. 
God sets out the terms and the conditions by which humans can be in relationship with himself. In the Old Testament, which you could probably just translate as the Old Covenant, there are a number of different aspects to that covenant. Some say there are seven. I think we might have a little summary slide. I know some people like to set little pictures of the slides. Um, in Eden, with Adam, with Noah, with Abraham, with Moses, with the land, Israel, Palestine, with King David. Some focus on four, the covenant with Noah, Abraham, Moses, and King David. But what is happening in all of these covenants is that God is setting out the terms and the conditions by which a person can be in relationship with him. And that is really important. Because as humans, at the center of our universe, we tend to think, well, you know, I want to be in relationship with God. I want to be acceptable to God. I want uh, to know God. Therefore, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. That's how religion operates. Um, if, if I just do this and don't do that, if I just give some money to charity and I'm a nice guy and i not too naughty, then I'll be acceptable to God. Then I can be in relationship with God. It does not work like that. It's never worked like that. Because you know what? In any relationship that God enters into, he is always the greater party. Only he gets to set the terms and conditions and expectations of that relationship. Because he's God. So covenant. What I'm going to do, please forgive me if you're really into your theology and doctrine. I'm going to oversimplify and summarize the covenants, the old covenant. I'm going to group them together, the Adamic, the Abrahamic, the Mosaic. And I'm going to compare them to the new covenant. And I've been praying for you this week that as we do that, the Holy Spirit is going to bring about for every single person a greater revelation of just how amazing Jesus is and just how amazing this relationship is that we are invited into. That's what we're going to do. And just as an aside, deliberately, in, intentionally, there is no application point for this preach. There's no to-do list. There's nothing for you to go away and to do. We will respond to God's word today. Uh, one of the ways we're going to respond to God's word is by sharing bread and wine together. A new covenant meal. A communion meal that Jesus has invited each of us into. So, what does the old covenant look like? Well, it is most simple. The old covenant looks like this. God says... Here's my side of the agreement. I will be your God and I will be faithful to you. And the people say on their side, we will be your people and we will be faithful to you, God. Now, the small print, the terms and the conditions, they vary from those covenants, covenant to covenant. For Adam and Eve, we call it the Adamic covenant. God's part was to be with them in intimate, unbroken union with them. Their part was to care for the earth, to steward it, to rule over it, and to not eat from the forbidden fruit, the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. That's the Adamic covenant. Then God enters into covenant with Abram, the Abrahamic covenant. God says to Abraham, I will be your God. I will be faithful to you, Abraham. I'm going to make your descendants so numerous that they will become their own people. And I'm going to give them a land of their own to enter into and to live into. And I am going to bless you and your descendants so abundantly that all nations on earth will be blessed through you. Abraham, that is my side of the covenant. That's what I'm going to do for you. Now, Abraham, here are your terms and conditions. Genesis chapter 12. Abraham, I want you to leave the place where you now live. I want you to take your family, go on a journey. Uh, you don't know where you're going. You'll know when I tell you you're there. And Abraham, Genesis 15, I want you to trust me. 
I want you to believe me. That's your side of the covenant. Then we move to Moses at Sinai hundreds of years later. God has kept his side of the deal with Abraham. And now Abraham's descendants are numerous, a great nation, the Israelites. And they are on the verge for the first time of entering into this promised land. And God makes a covenant with the people of how to be in relationship with him. It's an amplification of the Abrahamic covenant. And this is what God says to the people. God says, this is my side of the deal. I will be your God. I will be faithful to you. I'm going to prosper you in that land. I'm going to provide for you in that land. More than anything, God says, I will be present with you. I will presence myself right at the heart of the community. That is my side of the covenant. Then God says to the people, here's your side. I want you to be my people. I want you to be faithful to me. I want you to obey me wholeheartedly. And God gives them the Ten Commandments and the 613 laws so that they can see what wholehearted obedience looks like. More than anything, that they would worship him and him alone. No gods, no idols. They would love and worship him and him alone. And that is sort of the essence of the old covenant. It's the idea that the writer to the Hebrews is drawing on. A covenant, an agreement between two groups as God. God says, I will do my part. I will be your God. I will be faithful to you. And the people say, we will be your people and we will be faithful to you, the old covenant. And um, it's not just a thing that happens in the Bible. Covenants were really common. They were a pretty big deal in the ancient Near East. Um, families, individuals, nations, tribes, they were entering into covenants with each other, legally binding agreements all the time. And occasionally an archaeologist will dig up a tablet that has the terms and the conditions that are engraved onto it. Uh, happening all the time. But here's the thing. In all of the covenants of the ancient Near East, you formalized that covenant, you made it binding, you solemnized it through the shedding of blood, through an animal sacrifice. And in fact, the Hebrew word for covenant is the word beirith, or beirith, and that word means to cut in its simplest form. You cut a covenant. So when you look in Genesis 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham. And then God says to Abraham, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get a young cow. I want you to get a, um, a goat. I want you to get a ram. I want you to get a pigeon. I want you to get a dove. I mean, bear with me, folks. The ancient world was a little bit more gruesome than it is now. Um, I want you to beirith, covenant. I want you to cut them in half. And I want you to separate them out on either side and to formalize that covenant, to make it binding forever, Abraham and God passed through the blood corridor. That's how covenants were cut. That's how they were formalized. That's how they were solemnized in the ancient world. You would pass through the sacrifice, the blood corridor. Similar thing happens at With Moses at the Mosaic Covenant, a sacrifice is made. And as a reminder, as a symbol of that covenant that was cut, from that time on, young boys had a cut made. Berith Milah, circumcision, a sign of the covenant. So covenants are legally binding agreements between God and humans with terms and conditions solemnized and secured through sacrifice and through the passing of through a blood corridor. And now we are getting to why we needed a better covenant. Now we're getting to the heart of why we needed a new covenant. Because these covenants are wonderful, aren't they? Um, God and humans in relationship together through human obedience. Hang on, there's a problem. There is a fundamental flaw with the old covenant. You see, God is always faithful. God always keeps his side of the agreement, but humans, well, not so much. 
And again and again and again, this is the whole story of the Old Testament. You read it again and again. Humans simply did not live up to their side of the agreement. We see it in Hebrews 8 verse 7. Uh, the old covenant was flawed. God found fault with the people. They hadn't lived up to their side of the bargain. Let's turn to it again, Hebrews 8, and read it in the light of what we've talked about. And it's quoting from Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah's writing 600 years before Jesus, before the new covenant. He's writing 800 years after Moses and the Mosaic covenant. That is a lot of time of God, of a people not meeting up to their side of the covenant. It says this, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Now, let me just say something about that word new. Because in ancient Greek, there are two different words for new. The most common word is neos. It means new and improved of the same substance. That is not the word used here. The word used here is a less common word that means that is kainos. It means new of a different substance. So if we were using it today, we might say, do you know what? I had an old bike and now I've got a new bike. That's like neos. But kainos is a bit more like this. I had an old bike and now I've got a jetpack. Now, see what I mean? It's new of different substance. I'm going to make a new covenant. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. Well, why? How will it be different? I took them by the hand. I led them out of Egypt. They did not remain faithful to my covenant. They broke their side again and again. And so God says, I turned away from them. At that time, God was released from his obligation because of their lack of of faithfulness. Verse 10, this is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That is the essence of any covenant. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, no, the Lord. So, you know, this new covenant is nothing to do with any knowledge that you've got. It's not to do with any learning. It's not to do with any instruction. God says, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest because, this is how they'll know me, because I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sin no more. Now, now that you're all experts in the covenants of the ancient Near East, let's think about this this new covenant. There's God's side. What does God say he will do? What are the things that are God's terms and conditions? What is God's part of the agreement? Well, God says he will put his laws in our hearts and on our minds. He will make us into his people. He will forgive us and he will remember our sins no more. That is what God says he will do, which is pretty good, isn't it? That is a pretty good deal. Now, what is our part? What is our side? What are our terms and conditions? Well, that's a little bit more difficult to answer. Because as we start to look at it, we think, what are our terms and conditions? Well, let me tell you what it is. This is our side. Nothing. Nothing but to believe it. There is nothing to do on our part but to receive it. There is nothing to do to enter into this covenant but to accept it, to say yes to it, and to enter into it. You see, as soon as there are terms and conditions on our side to keep in relationship with God, we are doomed. I mean, we're stuffed. But this new covenant is a better covenant because it's all about him. It's all his doing. It's all his work. It's all his effort. All we have to do is say yes to it and to receive it. I mean, one of the very reasons that God became human in Jesus 
and took on flesh and blood as one of us, one of the reasons for that was so that he, as the perfect human, the sinless, perfect representative, could fulfill all of the terms and conditions of the covenant on our behalf for us. How amazing is that? God's like, I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to do it for you. And he puts his spirit in our hearts. And he empowers us to live for him. I was listening to a pretty old school um, Scottish preacher the other day called Alistair Begg. And um, he was talking about this idea. I'm just going to capture the essence of what he was saying. He was talking about this idea. You know when you say, if you were to die tonight and go to heaven, and you were to get to the gates of heaven, and the angel on the gate was there, and the angel on the gate said to you, why should I let you in? What would you say? That's what he was exploring this idea. He said some people would say something like this. Well, I tried to live a good life. I tried to be a nice guy. I tried not to be too naughty in life. Really? You think that's going to get you into a place of perfection? You have to be perfect to get into that place. Some of us, maybe we've been around church for a while. We get to that gate. The angel says, why should I let you in? And we'd be like, well, I tried to live a Christian life. I tried to follow Jesus. I asked Jesus into my heart. I gave my life to Jesus. This guy, Alistair Begg, was saying this, that any answer that begins with I is not enough. Any answer that starts with the first person is not enough. The only answer that's going to get you there is the answer that starts with he. The third person, because of him, because of what he has done. And he goes on to imagine this scenario of Jesus on the cross. You, you know that picture of Jesus on the cross? And on either side of Jesus on the cross, there, were, um, there was a thief on either side, a criminal on either side, each on their own cross. One of those criminals was hurling insults at Jesus. One of them was um, cursing Jesus. But the other thief, well, he dies, goes to heaven, he gets to the gates. The angel said to him, why are you here? It's like, I, d- I don't know. <laughs> the angel says to him, well, on what merit are you going to enter? Why should I let you in? And the guy says this, he says, I don't know, but all I know is this. The man on the middle cross, he said I could. The man on the middle cross, he said I could enter. You've got two helpless thieves, criminals on either side of Jesus. One rejects it, but the other simply receives, simply believes. And that's why this new covenant is the best. Because it means that being in relationship with a holy God does not hinge on my ability, on my effort, on my faithfulness, on my work, on my holiness, but only on his. It's all about his work and what he has done. The middle man on the cross, he said so. Can I have the team up, please? We are going to go into communion um, in a bit. And I want us to focus our attention onto Jesus. See, and if it helps you to close your eyes, close your eyes. But here's Jesus on the cross. He's nailed to a cross. His hands, his feet, they are pierced with nails and blood is flowing down. A crown of thorns has been rammed onto his head and blood is flowing down his face, his hair, his beard. His back has been whipped, lashed by skilled Roman soldiers and blood is flowing down. His side pierced with a spear and blood is flowing down. Why? Why did Jesus have to shed his blood? Why did Jesus die there on the cross? There are a number of correct answers to that. The one that we tend to major on, the one we tend to focus on is this. He died there as a sacrifice for our sin. He died there as a sacrifice for our sin. And that's true. It's wonderful. We should focus on it. You see, all humans, I I'm a sinner, you are a sinner. All humans sin, that sin separates us 
from a holy God, a holy God who cannot associate with sin. And this God of justice, this God of holiness, he has to punish human sin. He can't let sin go unpunished. And so as Jesus hangs there on the cross, this incredible act of love takes place. That God the Father, instead of pouring out the punishment and the wrath and the justice for our sin, instead of pouring it out on us, he pours it out on his son. He pours it out on Jesus. And there on the cross, Jesus bears all of our sin and all of our shame and all of our brokenness and all of the wrath of God. He bears it upon himself. Jesus literally died so you need not. His blood was shed so that yours need not be shed. It is the ultimate substitution. Well, that's wonderful news. I mean, it's incredible news. It changes everything. We should focus on that. But there is another dynamic at work as Jesus is on the cross there. A new covenant is being cut. A new agreement is being forged between God and humans. A covenant that is being solemnized and made binding forever through the shedding of blood. A new blood corridor is opening up. And we're invited to pass through even the very body of Jesus. We pass through from death and into life. This is a covenant made binding through the blood of Jesus. Well, how can I know that God's going to be faithful to me? How can I know that my sins are truly forgiven and that God remembers my sin no more? How can I know that he will sustain me in relationship with himself through to eternity sure? Look at the middle man on the cross. Covenant. Sealed with blood. A new covenant that we're invited into. We're going to spend some time just in thanksgiving and in worship. 